Well, good evening, and we'd like to welcome all of you out across Ohio and maybe across the Midwest uh, to our farm, OSU Extension Farm office hours again. Um, this will be our second edition of this. We are on last Monday evening, and here we are again tonight to help answer those questions um, in helping us as far as a farm community respond to the COVID-19 crisis. On behalf of our farm office team of Ben Brown, Peggy Hall, Diane Shoemaker, Julie Strauser, and Barry Ward, I'm David Marison, and I will be moderating tonight's session. Um, and there, there is our team. And just so you'll be, to be introduced a little more, Diane Shoemaker is our field specialist for the dairy production economics and has worked for OSU Extension for over 34 years. So I'm going to move from left to right as you see folks on the screen. Uh, next is Barry Ward, who is the director of the OSU Income Tax Schools and the leader for production business management for OSU Extension and has been employed with OSU Extension for over 29 years. And then our youngster on the team, Ben Brown, on the top of your screen, who is an assistant professor for professional practice in agriculture risk management in a Department of Agriculture, Environmental and Development Economics. And Ben has been with us at OSU for two years. And then next, myself, I'm David Maris. I'm currently the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources for Coshocton County. And I've been with Ohio State for 23, 23 years. Next is Peggy Hall, who is an associate professor and also the director of the OSU Ag and Resource Law Program. And Peggy has been with Extension for over 20 years. And behind the scenes making all the magic work is Julie Strauser, who's a program assistant for agriculture and natural resources and has been working with OSU for 17 years. As we kick off tonight's program, uh, just uh, an and that should say COVID-19 instead of COVID-10, but the Federal Resource Guide was released today. So the United States Department of Agriculture and its federal apartments released a, a resource matrix today that will help communities, rural communities, and, and whether that's healthcare, whether that's extension folks, agribusinesses, as a guideline to deal with the, with the COVID-19. And you can access the guide there. And just to give you a peek at this, if you go online, uh, there's the website that you'll see. And, uh, and what's really nice about this resource, again, just hot off the presses today, uh, that you can find um, your category. Now, for instance, if I'm an agriculture producer, I can go and there's the links to the technical assistance that I might be able to um, obtain, as well as financial assistance, and then some general state and local resources. And this is a, about a seven page matrix um, and it's available as we get again on the USDA's website and you can access it um, on this website and we'll add that to the chat as we go tonight so you'll be able to grab, um, grab it and be able to bookmark it to your computer. So our goal tonight is to start with going back and we had as we exited last Monday's program we asked everyone who was in attendance to put some questions in the chat box so that we would have them to kick off tonight. And so we've gathered all those questions. We're gonna to respond to those questions in kind tonight um, as we go. And then of course, we want to have plenty of time to be able to answer your questions. So we encourage you to put your questions. You'll see your screen for questions and answers. You can drop your questions in there and the moderators will be viewing those questions and we'll be slipping those questions in throughout the evening. So our first question, we're going to turn this question over to Peggy and Barry. And the first question that we had from last week was what has happened over the past week with the Paycheck Protection Program? That was the bulk of our discussion last week for the CARES Act, a big program out there, the Paycheck Protection Program. So Barry, um, Barry and Peggy, we're going to turn this question over to you. Okay, thanks, David. Well, the answer to the question is a lot. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of activity in the Paycheck Protection Program. Quite a few applicants have applied for those funds, even though there are some dangling questions yet about how the program will play out and what some of the applicants need to do um, in order to qualify or to uh, prove, document their involvement in the program. Congress, due to the popularity, and we think about half is the prediction that we heard today, about half of those funds are committed 
And, and due to that popularity, Congress is discussing adding another $250 billion to the program, but the House and the Senate um, have not yet agreed on how that, how, what provisions will be tied to that additional funding. So we're waiting to see, I, I believe it will go through, the question is how will it go through that additional money that will go into the program. And Barry, we were talking earlier about still having some issues with the self-employed. What are you hearing on that? Well, that seems to be one of the biggest uh, issues. The biggest unknowns right now is how self-employed folks are going to apply for this and what they're going to use as their, as their loan application amount. And there's been no guidance. So we're all sitting out here wondering when that's going to come. Hopefully it does come. Um, but there's nothing that's out there that's giving us any definitive information about how to uh, put together our numbers if we're a self-employed person, not someone that's applying on behalf of just their employees, but a self-employed person or a self-employed person with employees. So those are the two areas that there's a lot of gray area, right? I mean, we just don't know. And, um, it's kind of uh, one of my colleagues today described it as kind of like the wild west out there because uh, all the, the banks seem to have many different procedures, uh, different documentation requests. Uh, some are applying for self-employed individuals. Some aren't. Uh, we even have reports that some are still pushing back against farms and agriculture. So it's such a mixed bag across Ohio and across the Midwest that, um, that we really don't have clarity on some of these things. Yes, and we thought we would have clarity by Friday when they opened that application period for the self-employed, but there was not an additional um, bit of clarity on that particular issue. SBA and the Department of Treasury has been posting nearly every day a list of frequently asked questions, and that's intended to update the guidance that they've given on the program. But again, we've not seen anything on that particular issue that has given us more clarity on how to calculate self-employed payroll costs, basically. Yeah, we've heard reports too of, of some banks going ahead and filing on behalf of the, the folks that have applied, self-employed people uh, without employees. Um, but what's that number? And some are pointing towards a Schedule C or a Schedule F in the case of farmers is kind of the underlying documentation that, that you would need to perhaps apply and, and supply the bank with. But then the question becomes uh, what other income might be included? And, and the big one for farmers is uh, Form 4797 because last year especially there was a lot of income that flowed there from trade-ins and other things. And they may not have had any uh, or very little income on their Schedule F. So that becomes another kind of uh, issue, big issue, as far as trying to figure out what that amount of income is that we do use to apply for these loans as a self-employed individual. It's, it's difficult. It is very difficult. And um, let's, let's just hope that um, the lenders are well versed and ready to make you know defend their decisions the sba has made it clear that they are deferring to the lenders to a large extent to verify uh, those payroll costs so right we'll see how that plays out too well and it becomes a, a matter of risk and reward i think uh, because folks are, are they know that there's a, a limited pot of money even if they do uh, supplement it with additional funds you know, there's a bit of a, a feeling of, of uh, urgency. So with that urgency and, and not having proper guidance, uh, people are just starting to take chances and some banks along with them as far as applying as self-employed individuals or self-employed plus employees, you know, mm -hmm. together what income that they think is appropriate. And we don't know what's going to be on the backside when they do request uh, forgiveness. At this right, point. and that's the other issue tied to this then. When they make, that'll be a separate application, we know that, for forgiveness. But then there will be additional documentation required for that application, and we don't know yet 
what will be involved in either that application or the, the documentation. There's been a lot of good advice thrown out to document everything you do, uh, but how much of that will in the end be forgiven based upon that determination of payroll costs? Yeah, and, and we heard, uh, well, well, there's supposed to be guidance coming out as far as the uh, yes. that procedure at least. At least they've told us that that's coming, so. Barry and Peggy, we have a couple questions that have come in through our question and answer feature of tonight's um, live office. So I wanted to throw those out your, your way. First, I, we had a, a remark from one of our counterparts that says they've heard some banks have been telling their farmers they're not interested in working with them to apply for these funds. And a follow-up question to last Monday night was, uh, we had some questions, a question posed at the end of last um, last week is farm credit or other such organizations considered to be a bank with a paycheck protection program. So those two questions kind of fold together and then I have another question after you answer that one. Which one would you like, Perry? <laughs> Go ahead and take the your first pen. one. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, the, the, the immediate question about farm credit, the, they, it's up to them. They can apply to participate. Uh, but the statute, the federal statute, uh, the act that was passed did make it clear that they could um, have that automatic approval as a lender, yet still they have to apply to participate in the program. So they definitely can do so. So that was the second question. And they, they, finally, they finally came out with their guidelines, right? Over the weekend, mm -hmm. Farm Credit did. So, so yes. we finally have a little more clarity from them. What was the first question, David? First question was just more of a statement than a question then it was that some banks have told their farmers they're not interested in working with them to apply for these funds. And We've heard the same thing. Yeah, so, that's, it's, it's a different story, it seemed like, uh, from bank to bank. I can't give you a, a good solution to that other than going to another bank, perhaps. No, the, go to another bank, perhaps. Yes, definitely, yeah. I know um, with the $250 billion increase, Congress is considering uh, dangling a few more incentives in front of the lenders because there has been hesitancy to get too involved and they have been overwhelmed. So that could be happening, but that's just a rumor. Uh, but there are definitely some rewards for lenders to be involved if they can uh, figure out how to do so and, and do it quickly. And some of them have been ahead of others because they do typically handle SBA 7A loans. So they've had a, a time advantage, whereas, you know, farm credit doesn't typically handle that type of a loan. So they're a little behind those other lenders. Okay, now we can proceed into the third question. I, and I hope I can frame the question in the, in the spirit that it was asked. But um, if we have an organization that has employees and those employees are coming from a staffing company, so essentially those employees are on the staffing company's payroll this organization pays as a contractor fee to the staffing company. Do you have an idea on how they can apply for the PPP um, loan if they're hiring contract labor through a staffing company like this? Well, I guess my first question would be, are they, are they uh, submitting a 1099 to the staffing company? Uh, is this something where they're, uh, that's my guess is that they're in an, if that's the case, then they're not able to include. And the answer is yes, Barry, they are a 1099 for the, for the staffing company. Well, I think the way we understand that and Peggy, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think we're, our answer to that right now is no. I mean, even though they're asked to, to be able to apply, that's one of the, the initialing uh, statements that you have to make that you have uh, employees or independent contractors that are working for you. Uh, however, they 1099 types of, uh, app, uh, the, not the, the employees do count. We count up all that, that wage, the wages that we pay employees, but all the, uh, all the dollars that we pay to those 1099s I don't think they're included. I mean, we're, we're fairly clear on that, I think. Yes, I agree, Barry.
Great. And those were the questions that were posed right now. Um, David, we actually had, we had one more question. Um, there was a question in the chat window that said, for payroll, will this include state, local, and unemployment taxes? For the payroll costs? Yeah. They've made it clear that the state and local taxes are included. I'm trying to think on the federal. Do you know how they're handling that very well, I think to put it simply, I think we can, it's simply the, the gross wages. So that does include all, including the federal. It doesn't include the employer's share. Okay. Uh, but it, it effectively, I think we can simplify it by saying it's, it's effectively the gross wages. Uh, somebody uh, chimed in, gross, yeah. Self, uh, I think that's the case. Uh, there's, there's been differing. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go back and look at that. Yeah. Um, more, but I think there. Um, the state unemployment taxes. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Is, is that included on top yes. of those wages? Okay, all right. Yes. I was drawing a blank. And Barry and Peggy, another question came through that we saw, uh, just for clarification, because we mentioned the, the 1099 that came through, but independent contractors still can apply for PPP, correct? Just to clarify that point. Yes, definitely. Yep. Yep, any other questions on paycheck protection? Well, I think that wraps it up for us, David, on that, unless there's anything you'd like to add, Barry. Peggy, there's a question came up on workers' comp. Do you want to answer that as far as the rebates, uh, the premium uh, paybacks? You want to talk a bit about that? I believe David was going to address oh, Right, We're, let's hold that. We'll question the workers' comp. BWC that will come up uh, a couple questions down the line so we can hang on to that question. There is a comment there about Oh no the question is no workers comp expense for the PPP does that is that included? Oh thanks Karen for that clarification. No I I think not that's not been right. Correct. There's also a comment in the chat screen about uh, larger banks are being more strict. Small banks are taking 1099s. I, I have a feeling that, well, I think it carries some risk if you're going to include the 1099 payments along with your empl regular employees. I, I would say that you're probably not going to have any, uh, well, you, you may have trouble getting that loan forgiven, perhaps. That portion, yeah. The SBA has clearly stated in its... Uh, frequently asked questions that that's not to be included. So that could be an issue that comes back later as far as the forgiveness portion. Hmm. Okay, have we tapped the All right. protection program? Uh, there's also a comment in there about uh, workers comp being included and I, it was, under, it was my impression that it was not, but that's something that, uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't remember that discussion or reading that anywhere that that was included, but there's one of our, uh, one of our participants, one of our folks, uh, James Schrock mentioned that. So, uh, so we'll Barry, have yeah, this may be one that we, that's the beauty of coming online every Monday night that we're able to pencil that question down and come back and maybe have some clarity on that next week. Yep. Yep, that sounds good. Okay, so- And that illustrates the challenges we're dealing with. We hear different yeah. answers from different lenders, and so that creates a little bit of confusion. Well, one of the, I'll mention one more thing and leave us with uh, food for thought. And one of the blogs that came out today, some of you may read is, uh, was discussion about uh, the, the funds, the amount of money that an independent uh, or a sole proprietor, self-employed individual would use in determining how much they would put on their application. And this particular blog was uh, 
indicating that a farm, for instance, might use gross income. And most of the folks that I've talked to today have uh, effectively, well, we've all agreed that uh, we think that it's net income. It would be the net, not the gross. But there's at least one voice out there that's saying that it, it might be a gross income. So I'm not going to totally discount it, but I, I think the odds of that being a, a, a type of a loan that would be uh, refundable, I think, are pretty low. So that's perhaps a discussion we'll have further next week. Great. And the next question that we're going to transition into, and that's the beauty of um, um, the a person asked the question on their exit interview or exit survey as we went out of last week's program. And who would have known, Ben Brown, that this week uh, the news, especially the chatter, even in through today, is about what's going on with these export markets. It's going to lead us into a couple questions as we go here. Um, but the, the next question was, is what impact is COVID-19 having on the export markets? So, yes. Ben, we're going to throw it your way on this question. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks for Peggy and Barry for uh, handling the pay Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it's very complex. Uh, I don't think exports are nearly as complex and they're still complex. So uh, thanks guys for doing that. Uh, but yeah, we did get this question. It came on our survey that we asked at the end of the webinar. So if you do submit questions, we are going to get those answered or at least make our best attempt at asking them. Uh, this has been something I've been following pretty closely. Uh, I think uh, this is just my assumption and, and the author of the question can tell me I'm wrong if, if he or she's on here again tonight. But I think the, I think the question was, was asked in the form of can China and can Canada and Mexico, some of our trading partners, live up to the commitments uh, to the trade deals that, that we've passed. Given that we've gone through a year and a half, uh, almost two years of, of trade negotiations between both Canada and Mexico, and then, then China as well, and getting the, the new USMCA passed uh, in place to set to, to go in place this summer. Keep in mind that it was 180 days after Canada ratified their portion of the bill. So it wasn't 180 days after the US ratified uh, the, the bill, but 180 days. So we're looking at a June uh, implementation period for USMCA. Uh, for most ag commodities, this left a lot of the, the, the tariffs um, low to nothing for most of our ag commodities, did make a couple of adjustments, especially in dairy, um, made some non-tariff uh, improvements in some of our other commodities. But uh, mostly the, the message coming out of commodity groups all year was do no harm uh, to agriculture and the NAFTA agreement. Uh, again, that'll take place this summer. So there were some, some questions. I think this question was geared towards more towards China, as, as we heard, you know, the promise of of increases in, in U.S. exports, especially food and ag products into the Chinese market. Um, and, and certainly that's something that's been in the minds of a lot of folks. Uh, you know, I think it's one of those things that maybe set us up a little bit. And again, I'm not discounting anything. I'm not getting hopefully into a political realm here from any standpoint, but there was this hope that exports would eventually start, uh, start flowing out of the country. Uh, and that would help give us a short term price bounce uh, that, that would allow us to get some marketing done for the for the new crop coming in this summer, but then also sell some cash uh, corn and soybeans from the 2019 crop if you've got any of those in storage. Ultimately, what's happened is a lot of that just hasn't developed uh, due to some, some logistics, uh, some challenges at, at ports and, and the, the lockdown of, of countries due to COVID-19. And I'll talk more about that here in just a second. But, uh, you know, I think one of the things that happened because of that is if you look at our stocks on hand and unpriced grain at this point, we're sitting on a lot more unpriced corn, especially corn and soybeans um, as a result of that, right? Just kind of the, the hope that eventually we'd see some market bounces that allow us to move some of that grain. Uh, obviously, those haven't transpired and we've actually gone the other way is now we're you know, we're seeing ethanol demand, uh, you know, really taper off 672 million or bar billion, excuse me, million barrels of, of ethanol produced a, a day, which is, you know, roughly six and a half million bushels of corn less per day uh, used for ethanol than what we were, you know, just a couple weeks ago. So some significant demand destruction. However, what this has done, and the reason I kind of pulled this all together um, in a way is, is we are seeing places around the globe that maybe entered into this COVID-19 um, situation and outbreak ahead of us. They're now coming out of it a little bit ahead of us um, just from the natural scale of it. So 
if you heard my Outlook talk in January and December, and I know Barry heard it like 20 times, but one of the things I kept talking about is, you know, there was the promise and there was the economic setup uh, to export more U.S. corn. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of all flowing towards the idea that South America was going to be tight on corn supplies. We were going to see the, you know, we had seen the price of corn in Brazil, especially start to really peak. Um, and, and to move corn out of the United States into some of these other markets, right? So it was there. Um, it just kind of got delayed for a while due to COVID-19 working its way through China. So one of the nice things about, uh, you know, exports um, is we are in a globalized market and a globalized world. And we depend on these global markets for, for ag products, um, some more though than others. Uh, but we're a dominant producer of corn in the United States. And it just happened that last week I did a market outlook, um, a little Facebook webinar talking about one of the bright spots on the corn side um, is the really strong pickup in corn exports. And again, this is kind of a product of low prices, curing low prices. People like to buy and other countries are taking advantage of it. The nice thing about these, these export shipments that we've seen uh, three, two weeks ago, uh, excuse me, three weeks ago, uh, 71 million bushels of corn exported one week and then two weeks later another 72.8 million bushels. The nice thing about these is it's kind of an even distribution across countries. So normally we see Mexico come in, usually it's the end of the calendar year. Mexico is uh, one of our largest buyers of corn. Uh, usually we see Mexico come in and make one really large purchase of U.S. corn a year. And that typically happens in December. And you can see it, it you know, last year, the black line there for the corn export net sales. And again, these are net sales, so they're not on the boat leaving yet, but they've been spoken for, if you will. Um, you know, uh, that black line represented Mexico's purchase last year. You see the, the peak um, right there around that same period again this year. Again, that was Mexico making up the bulk of that sale. When you look at our sales now, and this is again, normally the time period where we're tapering off of corn exports uh, due to South America coming in and, and adding, or excuse me, bringing their second crop corn onto the market. Um, these, this time around, we've got Saudi Arabia making big purchase of corn. We've got Japan making a big purchase. We've got South Korea making a big purchase. And we've got Mexico also in the picture as well, along with China purchasing some corn too. So some well distribution, obviously we can't, you know, we're not exporting enough corn to make up for what we've lost in, in ethanol demand, um, but it is promising and bright that we're, we're seeing these corn exports up until the last couple of weeks. And really last week, uh, we, were, we were somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% below um, what we needed in a season average pace to reach our USDA forecast or what USDA was estimating for the full year. We've kind of caught up to that now. Um, so the question becomes, can we continue to see these strong exports? And I think we can, okay? Um, and I, and I think we can, especially if, if the dryness in Brazil continues. Uh, last week, they got some promising rains in southern Brazil, northern Argentina, um, that'll help their corn crop, especially that second crop that's stage. But you know, if we see prolonged dryness down there and their soils aren't real good for holding moisture, um, they're pretty unforgiving. Uh, so to see continued soybean or corn exports would be promising, uh, especially if they had a short crop. I think we can get there. I do want to talk a little bit, let me switch from corn and then I'll go to soybeans and then we'll finish up with livestock really quick. You know, one of the challenges we've seen on the soybean side is we're about 200 million bushels below uh, what we need, the pace we need to meet USDA's uh, soybean exports. This last week in, uh, on Thursday the 9th, uh, USDA dropped their soybean exports by 50 million bushels uh, due to the slow pace of, of soybean exports out of the United States. Uh, this doesn't mean that soybean uh, imports or soybean trade globally uh, is, is increasing. Uh, if you think about a pie, right, if, if the pie is increasing, then all the, the pieces of the pie are getting bigger. Um, in this case, it's really not the pies getting bigger, it's just reshuffling of the players. And we're seeing Brazil uh, really export really strong, um, uncharacteristically strong at this point of the year, even though they're coming off, you know, what they would consider, you know, their harvest for their first crop full season soybean. So they're usually exporting a lot during this point of the year. Uh, but we're seeing record exports uh, from March and they're expected to be above that in April given signals. The other thing, and this is maybe what's more challenging for me on the soybean side than the U.S. soybean export picture, um, is from the standpoint that currency uh, exchange rates right now are actually incentivizing Brazilian soybean producers to actually produce more soybeans next year. So stick with me for just a second. What I've showed you down here in the bottom right hand that red line is uh, Ohio, what I'm gonna count is Ohio soybeans. So these are Toledo cash prices. 
Um, at the current point, you can see we've fallen down and then kind of leveled out, rallied a little bit, and then leveled out. Again, these are Ohio soybeans, so we've got a positive basis right now, historically strong soybean basis in parts of Ohio. But still, nonetheless, the signal um, disincentivizing soybeans from what they were, right? Maybe, maybe not totally switching, but less than what they were. The black line, that's Brazilian soybean price. Keep in mind, this is a year, and this is in the Brazilian reel. This is the point of the year when the Brazilian soybean price normally falls off, right? They're coming out of their harvest, price is lowest to the harvest. But because of the currency exchange rates and the race from uncertain, unsafe currencies, like the Brazilian reel, the Russian ruble, uh, you know, some of these, the Argentine peso, right? Some of those non, not as safe currencies compared to the US dollar, as we see, um, then race to the U.S. dollar. That exchange rate um, makes it you know, difficult for us to compete. Now on the corn side of the equation, Brazil was tied on corn. So their price of corn was staying elevated, um, allows us to compete. Our advantage is sterile air and corn. We don't have that same advantage in soybeans. Uh, the Chinese uh, yen to, compared to the Brazilian real is, is strong. They can buy Brazilian soybeans cheaper than what they can U.S. soybeans. Um, but back to my discussion about the Brazilian soybean producers are being incentivized to produce more soybeans. Go on, they can do the same thing we can, right? They can go and lock in a high futures price on the Brazilian futures board um, for soybean production next year. And if their currency devalue, you know, it gets strengthens or strengthens again compared to the U.S. dollar, you know, it'll come down. But that price is still locked in there at a higher rate, right? Um, so they're forward contracting and taking major profits to produce soybeans. So that's probably what concerns me most a little bit on the soybean side um, is a little bit of, we could see not only a record crop last year in Brazilian soybeans, followed by another record crop this year, but we could see an even larger US, or a Brazilian soybean crop next year putting, putting weight on the soybean export picture. So again, some challenges on the, on the soybean side, but promising on the corn. Uh, David, would you mind flipping to the next slide real quick? By the way, I broke the rules and did slides. Uh, we had decided not to do slides, but I broke the rules. I want to talk about livestock because this is where I think we could actually see uh, some shipments. And, and I think this is where the question really was coming from in terms of can we meet our export commitments? COVID, or can China meet their export commitments? So they're, showing, they're showing interest in at least meeting their, their, their U.S. ag and food product commitments from the United States. However, as we've kind of said all along here um, at Ohio State, Dr. Sheldon and I, we've talked a lot about it might not come in the products that we normally think they would. Um, I'm talking about uh, sorghum, grain sorghum. We don't produce a lot of grain sorghum in Ohio, but if you look at grain sorghum, they've been actively buying grain sorghum, especially if they get their anti-dumping duties figured out with grain sorghum. Uh, we're seeing strength in that market. Uh, we're seeing some strengths in some other markets. Again, not what we usually produce here in Ohio, but the one area I think we could is in pork. Um, we have pork, a lot of pork here in Ohio. Um, you know, we look at, this is the, the forecast, the latest forecast compared to the January forecast there in the, so I'm looking at the bar graph. The slash lines are the January forecast. The, the solid bars are the April forecast for estimates in terms of U.S. exports of beef, pork, and poultry. Um, you can see the historical uh, exports there to the world in the in the graph. So I'm not just talking about China here, but the reason I, I did me mention China is one of the things that's exited the news lately, or since this COVID-19 thing started, um, was the um, uh, China's handling and dealing and rebuilding back their pork stocks after African swine fever. Um, it took about 45% of China's breeding hogs out of the picture um, that bigger reduction in pork opens up the, the door for major pork suppliers around the, the world, the European Union, the United States, to export pork into, into China. And so if we can keep our supply chains going, as I said, if, um, it's, not, it's not something I'm overly concerned about, but it is something that I think is a concern right now, is if we can keep our supply chains moving, I think there is uh, the strong possibility to see pork imports uh, into China. Keep in mind, that with pork prices falling like they have, uh, on balance, uh, as, you know, an economist term, right, if everything else is equal, uh, China is now able to buy pork cheaper today than they were a month ago, and that should spur some additional pork exports. So I think pork's one of those possibilities that we see. Um, the question now becomes what happens to the other, what happens to the other products, right, and we think about beef and, and chicken as well. Globally, 
Uh, we just know that when we go into these panic scenarios, um, these pandemics, if we go into economic crisis where people are eating more from home than they normally would, we saw this in the Great Recession of the last decade, we've seen this time and time again over the last several decades, um, is when this type of economic shock happens, uh, we see less consumption of protein in the form of animal protein and more in the form of grain proteins. And that's why we've seen this diversion in livestock. We showed you the graph last week about how the animal proteins had all fallen off in terms of uh, futures and cash prices, where we'd seen some support uh, in wheat, uh, rice, uh, products like that. And so, um, you know, we do expect to lose beef and, and chicken exports as a result of this, slower economic world growth, uh, slower demand for it as people aren't aren't as traveling as much, and when you're not traveling as much, you naturally don't eat out as much. Um, it's been it's been interesting. I'm a big fan of Rick Steves' travel, and so the last couple of weeks I've been watching Rick Steves' videos to to get my European travel vacations in rather than actually going because we can't go anywhere. But you know, I'm still eating at home rather than eating somewhere else, and so uh, we do expect that to slow down. Uh, I think the question I have, um, and, and again, I'm no health doctor at this point. Um, is, and again, this comes to questions that we probably don't know about the virus at this point, but there is some that believe that this virus, COVID-19, is very seasonal, uh, where, it, where it pops up and, and is uh, used to cold temperature and, and moves and affects uh, people in cold temperatures. Uh, we're going to switch seasons here very quickly with, with South America, the Southern Hemisphere, to where we're going into our summer months and they're going into their winter months. And, um, you know, Brazil and Argentina both have a lot of animals of beef and poultry. Um, and the question becomes, do, if they start having some of the supply chain issues, like, you know, we potentially, you know, the, the issues we're seeing now here in the United States are maybe even far worse. Does that limit their ability to export? And can we see even more exports of, of meat products out of the United States? And that's something I don't know. We'll have to see if it carries over into the winter months in Brazil. They are dealing with it now. Um, does it get worse as we move into the winter months down there? Not sure. Um, but long story short is we've seen slow exports uh, from the United States into China. If that is the question, are we meeting those, China, those trade commitments? Um, you know, it's been slow. Uh, we're going to have to see a pickup in, soy, in exports, um, especially you know, potentially ethanol. I'm still having a hard time figuring out how we get ethanol into China. They have no mandate. They have no incentive to burn ethanol in China. Um, it's going to take some group like the National Corn Growers investing in Chinese infrastructure, which, you know, I'm not saying it's not there, but it's going to take something like that for them. Uh, even though ethanol does kind of work in economically, there's just not the infrastructure there for it. Um, they have interest in DDGs. Again, we potentially won't have many DDGs. We've slowed our ethanol down. Uh, you know, we're going to use all those DDGs we can here in the United States. Grain, sorghum, fruits and nuts out in California, things like that could potentially get in there, but I'm looking at pork as kind of like the shining star that could get into the Chinese market. Um, the reason we really haven't seen that translate into the cash prices is we consume 70% of our pork domestically, um, and we've seen pork really fall off as a result of these you know, stay-at-home orders and eating at home and not eating out as much. Um, hasn't you know strong export demand hasn't made up for what we've lost domestically so with that i've talked way too much um but if anybody's got any questions i'd be glad to answer them but uh, i you know looking at the export picture we could see some some support so thanks ben uh any questions that any, anybody has on the exports if not we're going to go into maybe a little hotter topic closer to home and a question that was uh, posed out there. Will Ohio counties delay property tax payments? Again, a question that was submitted right at the end of last week's broadcast. So Peggy, I think we're going to bounce the ball to you on this one, correct? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to unmute. Um, yes, we've been in uh, discussion with the County Commissioners Association to see what they're hearing from counties on this issue. And, and that question has certainly been raised. And we understand that there is some interest in a few counties in a, a 30 day delay. So not a significant day for those taxes due in July. And that, that ability is there under the Ohio Revised Code to ask for that delay to that goes up to the county to the uh, I'm sorry the Department of Treasury taxation and they can make that decision then for the county to delay that 
uh, payment, the county then, through its treasurer, would be the one making that request. The, um, there's also a process there that allows them to waive penalties for late payments. But when it comes to waiving interest, that decision is made at the state level. So that would go up to the Tar Department of Taxation. And what I'm hearing on that is that it, it, it's a wait and see what happens. See, let's see how long this is drawn out. Those interest penalties on late taxes don't kick in until de December um, anyway. And so there may not be need to uh, worry too much about that. And so they're taking that position. Let's just wait and see. I think there's a hesitancy for many counties to go this route. And that's because their revenue streams are already being impacted. And so this could be an additional hit on the counties. And Barry, are you hearing anything different? No, just what you've uh, discussed. You know, as you mentioned, we haven't heard reports of too many counties requesting this, just a handful. Um, so it's not widespread yet, but uh, I guess we'll see. Yeah, I don't expect it to be widespread based on uh, my discussions with CCAO. All right, Dave. Yeah, I think that was a quick, a quick answer, but a question nonetheless less that has been out there on people's minds. And then the next, I think we're going to move more to the more to the consumer end of it, and. That's what we've, we had a fascinating discussion last week about milk prices and milk dumping, and that kind of leads into some of the questions we're asked, uh, are going to get into here as we transition. First, the shelves are bare, meat prices are dropping, why? So Ben, we're going to toss that your way about what's going on, a lot of news, especially today, we're seeing um, with slaughter plants closing because of COVID-19 with workers' health, and we're seeing a lot of action in this side. So what gives? Yeah, and this, this has been a hot topic for like a week. We've been following it pretty closely uh, for, for a while and, and even checking in with our Ohio producers and processors um, here. Uh, luckily, you know, most of the closings that we've heard at processor levels have happened outside of Ohio. They still have an impact in the, in the meat markets because we are intertwined domestically in, in some of these meat markets. Uh, the one in South Dakota um, that, that went down represented, you know, it was a big player uh, in the pork complex. And so you know, we'll continue to watch those as, as we go through uh, the next couple of days and weeks. A uh, couple of things, and I'll talk about, you know, what this could mean long term. But we did get these questions in terms of, hey, the shelves are empty at the store and my cattle prices or my pork prices keep following, falling, you know, why is that the case, right? And there's this assumption that there's been an increase in demand. And I, I'm going to push back on that just a little bit, you know, for what we assume to be every, you know, dollar of, of lost uh, uh, food service demand. So if you take a dollar of food service demand, we only figure about 30% of that gets picked back up at the retail level. So we're still losing a huge chunk of our of our meat demand, both pork and poultry, or excuse me, pork and beef, um, just by switching out of retail into, or excuse me, out of food service into retail. And it's kind of the same thing Diane was talking about last week with milk. It's hard to pivot going from pint milk to you know, the gallon jugs or half gallon that you get at the store. Kind of the same things here. And so what I've done here is I've just broken out the wholesale cuts, and these again are wholesale, not retail, of of beef carcasses and then we're going to look at pork carcasses on the next slide um you know the 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 uh the gray shading area in the background that is the that's the whole carcass so this is a weighted distribution of all these primal cuts based on the percentage that they bring to the animal carcass when we take that and, and weight that based on the percentages and then the prices they're getting and if you look at the beef complex here um, again the only two cuts of beef that are up and I, again, I'm drawing that black line kind of in the middle. That represents when major sporting events like the NCAA tournament, some of these conference basketball tournaments, the Big Ten tournament, if you will, when they called it. And not to say that this pandemic, the COVID-19, wasn't an issue before that. Um, that's just what I look at and say that's when the general public, that's when all of us started to realize, hey, this is going to get serious and I need to go to the store and get stocked up before they shut my store down, right? Before that, it had been growing. But 
March 12th, 13th was kind of that big event, that matchstick, if you will, that said, hey, this is bigger than we realize, or it's getting bigger than we realize, and we need to, we need to stock up, right? So if you take March 12th as the date, the only two primal cuts on the beef complex that are up um, are the chuck and the round, right? And those both go into ground beef. So when we think about retail demand, it's, it's really stocking up and getting that freezer beef and freezer demand that we've seen. All the other cuts are down. I always like to use the expression of a steak, right? I love a good steak and I went to my store on Saturday and ground beef was selling for a dollar a pound less than a, than a prime ribeye, right? That doesn't happen. That signifies is the increase that we've seen in ground beef prices at the, at the retail sector and the decrease in steaks. Again, if you, you know, I love a good steak. I think I can cook a good steak, um, but I have more confidence in Longhorn and Texas Roadhouse and a couple other restaurants making me a better steak than what I can, can produce myself. So I typically eat a steak when I go out, right? If I want a steak, I'm going to go out and get it. So we've seen that fall off, right? But the whole, the whole cutout of the beef carcass is still up a little bit, but it's coming down. So I don't think it's going to support, I guess this is my, my foreshadowing a little bit. I do not think we're going to see the, the cutouts of the beef as a whole, as a composite, staying elevated as I think it's going to come down. It's really been propped up with ground beef uh, cutouts like the chuck in the round. David, would you mind going to the next slide, please? This is the equivalent on the, on the pork side. Of the, of the equation. Again, the gray shaded bar in the back is the composite, the, the weighted percentage of all these cutouts, primal cuts, as a share of the whole carcass. Again, the black line representing that, that kind of that key date that I was talking about when, when we kind of really started to see the spike up in retail demand um, as, we, as we look forward. And you can see that the cutout for pigs have been significantly bigger, um, down 24% as a whole carcass. Um, 24% as a whole carcass from today since uh, March 12th. And the only pork cutout that's up is a loin, right? That's the, that's the part that, that gets us the, the pork chop cutouts as well. Um, stuff that you can buy at the retail store. All the other composites are down. All the other primals are down. Probably most notably, and you probably heard about it, we actually even had an extension educator bring it up on a, on a call this morning with all of a, our extension educators the impact that this has had on bacon. We consume a lot of bacon at the food service level. Uh, you go to Bob Evans, you go to Waffle House, something like that, you're, you're gonna get bacon. Uh, we don't eat as much bacon when we're home. So I've kind of you know, tongue in cheek tiled this. It's time to bring home the bacon. If you look at bacon, which is represented by that yellow line there, the belly of the pig, it is now running even with, with hams. That doesn't happen. Um, and we've seen that crash in bacon, the stockpiles. So when I look at these cutouts and I start thinking about, okay, you know, have we actually seen a growth in demand of pork and beef? My answer would be no. I, I do not believe we've seen an increase in demand, a run up in stores. The reason the shelves are cleared and cleaned is it's been in that freezer um, primal cuts uh, and we've seen all the other composites down and that's being strunkled through uh, to, the, to the packing level. So our packers, when you think of, um, you know, all these packing plants that are shutting down, they're also getting the signal from the retailer saying, hey, we don't need as big of a demand surge as what we did two weeks ago. And you can see the, the spike went up and then it's fallen. They were signaling to the packers, hey, we need more meat. And that's why a lot of these packers, JBS, National Beef, they were giving a premium, $10, $15 a head to get more animals through the door. They're now even starting to slow that down. Now we have even a health concern. Now we have health concerns of our workers. They're telling the you know, packing inspectors, hey, you gotta come up with your own mask. You know, we, can, we will reimburse you, but you gotta come up with your own mask. Um, this is an industry, the packing industry is an industry that uh, does not work six feet apart. It was not set up to work six feet apart. Um, and so when you spread those workers out, you're slowing down the lines, you're slowing output, and as a, return, as a result, you're getting a bottleneck. So now we're entering the period, um, and I said this last week too, I kind of alluded to this last week, we're now entering the period where the, the packing plants are now getting the signal to slow down demand because the retailers are not asked for it and we don't have the food service as strong as what we did. And we've got the health concerns. So it's kind of double to slow these plants down. Part of my impact, and the reason I'm giving a little pause to this, is I was talking with uh, Lida Garcia, our state specialist today, and she kind of confirmed what I had been hearing as well. A lot of these plants were expected to do maintenance and deep cleaning in the next couple of weeks. What they're doing now is they're moving that up and taking a prolonged deep cleaning now out by running plants later. So we've kind of, in some way, we can catch up. We'll also see some of these other smaller plants and even plants that are based on cow, call calves. 
um, pick up some of the steer and heifer market as well. Uh, so we, we can catch up, but we've kind of got this weird scenario going on where, you know, we're probably going to see heavier and, you know, in the, when the packers aren't working correctly, uh, when, when we're having trouble getting input through the packing facility to get output, that tends to give an incentive to bring on heavier weight calves. But because, or excuse me, it doesn't. It tells us to slow down the, the, the rate of gain in our calves, but we've also got cheap corn, right? So you can add on pounds with cheap corn and maybe even you know, soybean meal if you can get it, even though soybean meals come up. So let's stay with the corn for just a second. That gives you the incentive to add on pounds, but you, if, that's only if the packing plants are working correctly. Right? So we've got this catch 22 that three weeks from now, a month from now, if the packers are working correctly, yeah, we're probably gonna see, and corn's still at its same price because of reduced demand for ethanol and no DDGs and stuff like that. Um, you know, we probably we will see those heavier weights, but right now we're just trying to slow it down. The other thing that's come up is we've got lots of pigs, lots of cattle, those on the ground. Um, when we've got lots, when we've got a higher ratio of those on the ground compared to hooks, shackles, if you will, or hooks at the, at the packers, um, you know, that gives the incentive to the packing company, whereas you know, there'd be a little bit more bargaining uh, if, if we had less calves, less pigs on the ground uh, moving forward. So, just wanted to put this out there and kind of give a rundown of, of why we're seeing some of that, you know, see some of these, uh, these plants slow down, talk about deep cleaning, um, reducing output. That's, that's because of kind of this economic logic here. So, thanks. Ben, um, we have a question that came through the Q&A there for you. Any speculation on how long it might take for the retail restaurant packers to increase volume after the stay at home orders are lifted? That's a that's an excellent question, um, and and it's it's one that Barry and I started this conversation last week, and I've talked with several people this week. Uh, Barry, you can I'll I'll allow you to jump in too and give your side of the the story. Um, you know, we we haven't seen anything like this before, um, and the question that comes up, or at least is in my mind, is if the once these stay at home orders are released, how do people react? Um, my expectation, uh, and again, this is, I'm going to give you my side and Barry can give you his. My expectation, as soon as those stay at home orders are released, we're going to see a boom of social activity. Um, you know, I think these restaurants and, and food service chains can, can get back up in a pretty, pretty quick time just because we've seen a lot of them stay open. Some of the ones that closed down are just stopped for now. You know, they might have a little bit uh, of a lag time to get the products they need to get back up and running. Uh, but I think we'll, I think we'll get back out there. The reason I give pause is, is really because Barry pointed this out to me last week and I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Are people going to be concerned if the stay at home will go, ah, I'm not comfortable yet leaving and I'm going to be more reserved in my actions. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to come home. I'm not going to go anywhere else. I might go to the store. You know, what does that activity look like? And that's, that's what I don't know. And I think, honestly, I think our state officials and U.S. officials are even wrestling with that question, too. You hear them make comments or you hear them make statements related to, we don't want to release these stay-at-home orders until we're confident that, the, that the, you know, we're in a safe spot where it's not going to jump from person to person or, or you know, create a, a rally in the, the outbreak again. Um, and I think that's them being concerned that if they really, if they lift the stay at home orders, then people are going to have high amounts of social activity and we're going to see, um, you know, a, a relapse, if you will, in, in, in terms of our progress. Um, so that would be, I guess, my cautious is that I see it, I think it could happen. Um, but again, we don't know how people are going to react and there is the possibility that they say, hey, I just don't want to expose myself. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out. So. Barry, did you want to chime in or do you want me to go to the next question? Because I, I was hoping this next question would come through, um, Ben, because it's a question that's been on my mind here, a very astute question, especially we look at the swine industry. It's a well-oiled machine as far as uh, that production cycle of, of, of getting those hogs market ready and you don't wait for the next, the next batch is right behind them. So the question is, we have producers that have market ready animals today. And we've seen what has happened over the last week, um, especially the swine industry, but on the beef side, plant closures present them with a real marketing issue. So what options do they have when you have market ready animals on the hoof, as you said, 
what's our options? I mean, it's because we've seen what's happened. What would your um, suggestions be? Because we can't hold them forever. Yeah. So we, I find, we found our, my family, we found ourselves kind of in this spot um, this last weekend and even, you know, a couple of weeks back when this kind of started. Um, you know, we have built an industry, a meat industry that's on a, you know, as, you know, a ready basis. Basically, as you mentioned, the, the animals are ready. They go to the, the feed yard. Once they leave the feed yard, they go to the packer. The packer then takes it to the retail. And it's, it's bang, bang, bang all the way through the supply chain, right? We've done that and we built that on efficiency. One of the things that, you know, has to be asked, and I'm sure will be asked is, do we give up some of that efficiency to give us some more wiggle room? Obviously, if we didn't have a, a you know, a constant stream or that prominent following one after another, we have a little more wiggle room to, to absorb some of these shocks. So will we give up efficiency to take that on? That's a good question. Now, to the question that's at hand, I mentioned my family. Uh, we, we have livestock, cattle. Um, this is, you know, we calve and then we feed them out to about 1,200, 1,100 pounds of, of cattle and then we sell in the spring usually. And, uh, you know, we were, we were getting ready to sell when this all kind of hit. And then we had to sell this week because we were running low on silage, right? And it was just time. Um, so we had to sell into this, this down market, right? Um, and that's, that's something that's going to come up. The, I think, to me, what I don't have an answer for, and it, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be hard, is if you've got a large amount of animals and all of a sudden you have no buyer for your animals or you know, you're, you know, the, the yard is closed down, right? What does that do for the, the prices as, as we look forward? I mean, obviously we're gonna see them a lot lower than what we would have um, beforehand um, as, as we look at that. And we've seen that in the call cow market as well. Um, just the need for that, you know, those, those animals after we came off the, the boom, basically where packers were given an incentive to bring those animals in. So I really don't have a great answer what you do with a market ready animal um, if all of a sudden your your market goes away. Um, you know, I, I think you just you look and you try to find a market somewhere if you no longer have the means to, to feed that animal or you have labor issues to where maybe you weren't the one taking care of it, but somebody else was and that person's now sick and it's moving through the system. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, I think those are real concerns. I'm having real challenges with that too. Um, as I mentioned at kind of the beginning of this, luckily um, almost all of our, excuse me, all of our processors here in Ohio um, have, have remained working and in operation. The question is, do they continue? Uh, I think, I mean, I hope so. I, I hope no one gets sick and has to shut down because of this. Um, also, but I do care about worker safety. And so uh, we'll have to, we'll have to keep an eye on it. I'll, I'll look into that and see if I can't put something together for next week. And hopefully that gives us some time to, to think about this question a little deeper. Um, it's easier on the cattle side than the, the pork side. Um, but obviously we've, I've talked with lots of people that have slowed down the rate of gains of their animals. I'm trying to push that, that growth as slow as possible. So more of a maintenance mode. Great. We're going to, we had a delightful discussion last week about dairy, milk dumping, uh, what was going on in the dairy industry. I see a couple of my friends from up north that are in the dairy industry are on tonight. So the question that came in for Diane Shoemaker from our last event was, is it time for another dairy farm buyout program? Diane, what, what saves you? Well, I guess I'm going to focus on why it's probably not going to happen. Um, there have been some suggestions on how to help the dairy industry, like every commodity organization has made some presentations to USDA on how they might spend uh, the funds to help different sectors of the agriculture industry. And of course, those are just suggestions and there will be a lot of discussion of what can be done and then total costs are gonna be factors in what finally comes out as well. Um, and suggestions were made. Uh, National Milk Producers Federation put forward a proposal with the support of many different organizations in the dairy industry, including Ohio's um, program, Dairy Producers Association. Um, and those suggestions focused on things to help producers and things to help processors and things to help consumers. Um, but when we look at the potential for another farm buyout. I think we can just take a look at the next slide, David, and 
look at what has happened historically. Because there was a dairy herd buyout um, right about the time I started working with Extension. Um, but what I'd like to spend just a moment looking at this slide to get an idea of, of what, why it's not likely to happen again. Um, the dairy pricing scheme, for lack of a better word, is very complex and it's also influenced by policy. And what we see here on the left hand side, if you look at the bottom of this slide, we're looking at the years 1961 through 2011. And we're looking at what milk prices did over that time period. And we have three lines um, in this graph. There's a greenish line and it's the support price. So from 1961 until 2011 and actually through 2014 Farm Bill, there's been a legislation that has determined what the support price was for milk. And so you can see as we look at that green line, it, it increases quite exponentially until about 1981, it leveled off and then it started ratcheting in the room, the uh, lines above that represent um, two other important prices. The blue line is the all milk price, and that is representative of what a farm actually received at the farm gate. So that would be um, support price or the class three plus any what now we know is the producer price differential, any quality bonuses. Um, they might have received for milk at test, which would be three and a half percent fat, 2.99% uh, protein. And the interesting thing is we look at the 60s and really up until 83 is wherever the support price went, the all milk price floated pretty closely above it. And it jiggled around a little bit, but it was pretty predictable what the milk price would be. And the red line represents what we now know as the class three price. So that's the minimum price that um, all dairy farmers should receive as a starting point for the milk that they ship. And while it was really nice that prices increased pretty steadily through those first 22 years, um, that increase was largely driven by that dairy price support and it was supported by the government purchasing commodity, excess commodity off the market. Um, so it became expensive. And as a country, we said, we just can't um, support that. So the first big black line represents when legislation was put in place that started uh, decreasing that support price. And we can just watch that green line ratchet down to about $10 where it stayed $9.90, $10 until the 2014 Farm Bill when that program ended. But what did happen then during that time period is we had increased price volatility. And just that price volatility we saw from about 1981, where actually you see that red line dropping below the, the support price even was largely driven by the fact that there was almost always more milk than was needed to meet demand. So at that point, um, discussions were, how can we decrease cow numbers, decrease milk availability, and that Dairy Stabilization Act was initiated in the, in the 80s. And so right where the point of that arrow hits, you can see the prices were bouncing up and down but if we look ahead a, a more than a year or two and say, what influence did that really have on the volatility of milk prices, we'd say it had none. And it was a pretty um, expensive program where it allowed herds to bid in to um, liquidate their herd and paid for a portion of production for a couple years with the stipulation that that farm farmstead could not go into milk production for a number of years. And this could have been helpful, except that we live in the United States, and if you want to milk cows, you can milk cows. So people who were already milking cows increased production. 
as you can see, some prices became higher there in the late um, 80s. So because the non-buyout farms did not all have to either maintain current production levels or decrease, we didn't take care of the problem of oversupply. And over time, um, we've seen increased volatility in milk prices, as you can see there. It's become even more volatile in the last um, five years. And so for those reasons, I really don't see that that's going to be a viable alternative. Um, meanwhile, in this period in the late 80s, 90s, there was another program that uh, dairymen helped fund to help herds leave the industry. Um, and that obviously didn't have long lasting effects either. So our fundamental problem is oversupply of milk. And then it's been complicated by um, extended low milk prices, finally giving the signal that many dairy herds did leave the dairy industry. Um, some cows did, but um, it took a long time for us to see a net decline in cow numbers. And those were actually increasing here at the beginning of the year with the prices that we were seeing and hoping for. And now um, with the price crashes we've had, um, I was just looking in our um, May milk was trading at $11 today. And that is so under the cost of production for, I don't know anyone who has a cost of production of $11 when they're really looking at total costs. Um, and then the associated frustration, I know uh, um, we've got butter inventories building up, cheese inventories building up, yet a coworker had to pay $6 for a pound of butter last week. So very frustrating from the dairy end, David. Okay, so then the, thank you, Diane. Then the next question is that came through last week was how do we pay for all the bailouts? And I know this is gonna be more of a, a macro look, a big picture look, but uh, Ben, Barry, uh, how, do, how are we gonna pay for all this? And it sounds like maybe the PPP is going to be swallowed up here really quickly, maybe another round of money, so there's even going to be more money on top of the money that's been allocated already. So how are we going to pay for all that? I don't know who, who wants to chime in first. Yeah, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll, I'll kick it to Barry so he can uh, add anything he would like to add. We, we got this question in last week um, on our survey. Again, we do look at those, so make sure you'll get another one after you exit out tonight. So if you would fill it out, we'd greatly appreciate it. But we got this question of how we pay for the stimulus bill. None of us wanted this question, so I, I ended up with it, and I'm going to kick some of it to Barry as well. Um, you know, the, I've, I've got two things represented on here. You know, when we enter into these economic recessions, or in this case, maybe a, a flash recession to where, you know, it, where we don't have two consecutive quarters of negative growth, we might have one quarter of economic growth, and then it increases, you know, the, the next quarter. Uh, that would technically not be a recession. Uh, we would just have a, a flash recession or you know, a short-lived um, little spike here in terms of economic activity this quarter. Um, typically, when we enter these uh, economic periods, we, the, the Fed and the U.S. government has a couple of ways to, to, to help fight against that. Uh, the idea is in an economy that's 70% consumer-driven, where it depends on us buying products, uh, going to the store, buying products, creating economic activity. Uh, the, the biggest thing that you want for your, your citizens is to put dollars in their hand, one, so they have enough money to go buy stuff and spend, basically. Um, I think you can, you know, that's why the, the Paycheck Protection Program kind of exists, to keep you know, people, uh, you know, getting money. Um, we saw that huge $2.2 trillion stimulus bill, again, geared to get people money so they can go out and spend. But the second thing you need is you actually need working businesses. And this is, again, also, you know, the increase there in the, the interest around the Paycheck Protection Program from the standpoint that that's geared to help businesses uh, retain their employees. That way, when we come out of this, uh, that they're in a position where they're up and running, people have money to spend, and we can get the economy going again, right? That's, that's the idea behind that. 
Um, and that's, that's been, so the federal government does that two ways. They lower interest rates uh, to give more economic activity, easier to borrow, easier to get money to spend. Um, and then through large stimulus packages as well, um, they get the money into the hands of, uh, hands of the citizens. That's what happens in a recession. But when you have periods of really good economic times, the theory is that you should be working down a budget deficit uh, and working towards a budget surplus or a neutral budget. And you should also be increasing interest rates. Um, and we kind of saw that a little bit the last couple, you know, last couple of years where you know, we'd seen those rate interest rates start to increase again. Um, we were still at a historically low rate or low period of interest rates when we started this. And so we were, we were already really close to the zero bound or, or you know, a zero interest rate um, is, is what the Fed calls that. And so one of the other ways that the Fed provides support or the Federal Reserve can or provide support is by buying bonds and, and mortgages, um, pumping dollars into the U.S. economy uh, to help credit markets. Uh, we had seen that as a strategy in the last Great Recession where the Federal Reserve added significantly to their balance sheet. And you can see over the period of time, that's what the graph on the left is, is where the Fed's adding to their balance sheets to continue that. We had started to naturally work that down. And keep in mind, when you're buying bonds and mortgages, you don't necessarily have to sell those back. Uh, you just let them mature and they kind of roll off the, excuse me, you don't have to you know, um, sell them back to the people. You just kind of naturally let them mature and they roll off. Um, we had started doing that last summer and we had some trouble with the overnight repo rate, kind of went out of control. And so the Fed you know, started adding to their balance sheet again. Now we're in this period of time where the Fed's kind of like, we're, we're in this track to unlimited increases to our Fed. Um, some people believe that this is a new way to finance deficits and increase the, the money that the, the government owes. Um, you know, the, the question is, is it really a bad thing for the Fed to, to have that out there? And, and economists disagree on this, right? Um, but then the question became, how do we pay for this? So this is kind of the political argument. And I put three points up there of how people believe that we can pay for a deficit. The first one is cut spending. Um, you know, it's highly unpopular because no one wants to cut their own program. You're a legislature. If you go to DC and you start cutting stuff, um, a lot of times you're unpopular with your citizens, especially if it's your program that gets cut. In 2011, we tried to do that through the form of a government sequestration. And I hear this a lot because we do farm bill programs every, or we will be doing them every winter. And this, this winter, I got asked a lot from farmers, does the 6.8% government sequestration still exist? Yes, it still does. That was part of the 2011 Budget Control Act, where they basically put a cap on spending and then you know, limited, you know, there was a super PAC, super committee that was to cut government funds. Hasn't necessarily worked out the way uh, anybody thought it would. There's been a lot of adjustments to that, but it's one way to do it. Second way is to raise taxes, also unpopular. Uh, a lot of people, you know, it, it's believed that raising taxes slows economic growth. Um, however, it was a combination of those two back in the 90s. If you think back to George Bush Sr., the 41, right? He likely didn't get his second term in office because he uttered those important words, read my lips, no new taxes, and then he increased taxes, right? And people weren't happy with that after that he had told them he wasn't going to increase taxes. But what came with that was also a budget cut, um, reigning in the federal budget. And a lot of people believe now that that's what led to our budget surpluses there in the late 90s, early 2000s. So combination of those two. But then the third area is increased GDP faster than debt. Uh, this is one of those that everybody agrees. This is the ideal way to do it. Both Republicans and Democrats agree this is the ideal way to reduce the deficit would be to increase the GDP faster than we increase debt. However, there's disagreement on how to do that. Most Democrats think you do it by increasing government spending. Government spending is a form of GDP. So if you're increasing government spending, you're also increasing GDP and you're encouraging the private sector to spend more. Uh, Republicans believe you do it by reducing taxes, getting the tax burden off, off businesses. Therefore, they create more jobs, businesses or jobs return back to the United States and you increase the deficit or you increase GDP that way. So neither side can agree. They both like this idea, but neither side can agree on that. And it's been the, the debate for a really long time and it'll likely continue. So I do not have an answer for how do we pay for the stimulus bill, nor, you know, are we, you know, at what point does it become dangerous, right? That's probably when our lenders start to look at the United States as an unreliable, uh, loan, you know, and, and they you either have to default or something like that at some point. Again, not saying that's going to happen anytime soon, but I'm just saying that 
you, know, you look at our budget deficit that we've seen, and right now estimates are that the budget deficit for 2020 could be a negative $3.8 trillion. Prior to this, the biggest deficit we'd ever had was around $1.4 billion, and that was at the tail end of the Great Recession a decade ago. Um, so we are ratcheting up these annual budget deficits pretty quick, adding to the national debt. Um, how we handle that's a, a big question. So with that, Barry, do you have any comments or you just want to stay away from this? Um, you've touched on uh, many of the subjects and topics uh, that I would have said as well. So I really don't have a whole lot to add. Um, just, you know, the last bit uh, that we're, we're looking at as far as uh, how to solve the problem and where the tipping point is. And I guess uh, that's a question that we don't know the answer to. You know, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any laboratory to run experiments. We don't have yeah. any counterfactuals that we can use. So we, we really know you know, what is uh, the U.S.'s uh, debt per, uh, as a percent of GDP, and where do we suddenly start to encounter uh, larger uh, spending bills when it comes to uh, borrowing money? You know, when do our T-bill T rates, our, our treasuries, uh, when do other countries uh, and investors start to find those risky, you know, due to our debt load? Uh, does that happen as the sole superpower in, in the world, I don't know. You know. There's some other issues that come into it as far as uh, how far we can extend our debt as a percent of GDP. You know, we've seen some other countries, some European countries run into trouble, but um, you know, there's different sets of facts that go along uh, with uh, the US than I think than it does uh, with a country like Greece, for instance. So I, I just don't know. I don't know where that tipping point is, but. Yeah. Uh, certainly we're adding to it right now, both uh, the Fed and uh, in our fiscal deficit. So it's not pretty and um, both sides are going to have to at some point, I think, agree to uh, perhaps some uh, some measures, whether that's next year or the year after or four years down the road when we uh, maybe get a little bit clearer, more clear of this thing. It's It's tough to say when we're going to find the political will to do it. Now, the only other thing I would add is right now interest rates are historically low. Uh, as I mentioned, that's one of the ways the Fed finances and helps in, you know, get money into hands of people. But it also makes servicing the national debt cheaper. Um, every one percentage point, if you figure we have a $24 trillion debt, which we do, we're over $24 trillion in debt right now. Uh, if you do one percentage point, that's $240 billion uh, just in interest for a year. Uh, that's twice the size of USDA's annual budget. So all food stamp programs, all farm program payments, all you know, employee salaries for any of the USDA agencies. We could pay two times the size of USDA with just the interest in the federal debt for every one percentage increase. So um, just a little nugget there, I guess, for. And on the negative side of, of lower interest rates, you know, we, we know it affects savers negatively, you know, and savers include not only us as individuals, but also pensions. And that's something that uh, looking forward, you know, more forward, you know, what, what is that going to do to pension funds? And, and those are already in, in many cases uh, uh, stressed. Uh, so who knows what we're going to see in the next couple of years as those pension funds reevaluate their, their yields. And, and definitely something that not, not either side of the aisle was, was counting on doing was having to have, um, additional federal spending because of a coronavirus or a pandemic. So something that's going to be interesting to, to look for, to watch as we go forward and how we react um, as a country. And the next question I want to move to is I heard of a BWC dividend and I'm going to toss that my way. And, um, and the, the, the answer to that is, is absolutely yes, that there is a dividend. But before that, just want to mention about the Bureau of Worker Compensation, they had already uh, in point one had mentioned about delaying the insurance, unpaid insurance premium installments for March, April, and May. And employers were allowed to do that, deferred until June 1st. And at that time, um, we could just do it for it. You didn't have to, there was no, no fee to do that. It was free, you could do it. Your coverage would not lapse. So that was one of the, the first steps. And 
you know, for the Bureau of Workers Compensation, that, that three month period of those premium installment payments is around $200 million. They announced um, earlier um, at the end, um, last week announced April 10th about sending 1.6 billion of dividends back to Ohio employees. Now it's mentioned in, as you looked at the news release, it equals 100% of the premiums paid, your workers, uh, workers comp dividend, um, premiums that you paid in 2018. But I would say, don't be surprised that it's not equal to 100% as they do the calculations and the calculations are still uh, something that we're looking into and it's, it's behind the scenes of how that is calculated. Um, but just to note that if you have an outstanding balance in your account, it's going to cover for that. Then it's going to look at that March, April, May payment. Look at that. And then if you have a balance, then that balance is going to come back to you before the end of the month. And so they have a frequently asked questions page at the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, bwc.ohio.gov. There's the long look on your screen about how you get that. Uh, but really what this is allowing to do for a lot of employers is not have to make that payment uh, because they're going to roll that premium back to you. And uh, kudos to the Bureau of Workers' Compensation uh, because, and, and to, to employers as well, because we've increased the workplace safety, which has reduced injury claims. Uh, so this is one of those funds that has, uh, has been doing really well. So they have the ability through the rise code to be able to send some of the dividends back um, like they're doing. So uh, for some for some businesses, it's gonna be just, a, a, just an, a piece of the puzzle as you start to look at how do we help um, businesses mitigate what they're going through right now. So just um, definitely not the, the big answer to everything, but it's, a, it's a, a piece that could help nonetheless. So if you have questions on that, just go to BWC and then um, you can check out more information about that. And Peggy, I, I know we've kept it, it's hard to keep an attorney quiet for as long as we have, but we have, we have been able to do it as a team. We've kept her quiet for most of the night. Um, but I didn't know if you had any other thoughts on the Bureau of Workers' Compensation dividend uh, that they're giving back. And then we also thought we would throw in, are there some legal impacts that your team is monitoring? Um, in your office about what could be coming or impacts of COVID-19. And just as a reminder, as we turn it to Peggy, we'll take your questions and answers. Just type them in the Q&A box and we'll, and we'll as a team try to get those answered here tonight. So Peggy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, David. I think you all just saved me until the end so that we could send everyone off to bed with the law on their brains, which is a good way to fall asleep, right? our lack of let sleep. Me tell you, let me tell you what we're working on. Um, well, first I want to go back to the CARES Act for a moment because there are a few programs yet to roll out from that act that deal with unemployment. And typically we ag attorneys don't have to deal with unemployment law uh, or unemployment programs because ag doesn't uh, qualify for many of those benefits. But we now have an opportunity where agriculture could qualify for some of the pandemic unemployment provisions that are in the CARES Act. Those are still coming out. And they just, the Department of Labor just gave guidance to the states because they will be administered through the states, those unemployment benefits coming from the federal law. And so the states, many of them are still working on their startup programs for those new benefits. So they'll extend to some who don't typically qualify for unemployment like farmers, uh, like independent contractors. And we have yet to see how Ohio will administer its program, but they do uh, promise us that they're working on it and that we should see it pretty quickly. Just in the last week, they've gotten a lot of guidance thrown at them on this. Uh, the, the CARES Act does allow the benefits to be retroactive though to the date of the act rather than to the date when the state gets that program in place. So a lot there for those who are forced um, out of work for about a dozen different reasons that have to do with COVID. And if you can meet one of those provisions, then you could 
apply for those benefits. Now, the interesting thing about the CARES Act unemployment provisions is they add an additional 600 per week to the state amount. So could be a significant um, source of assistance for, for some of our people, especially those, uh, let's say like farmers market type farmers who have not been able to uh, do go at roller product out in the typical way because of COVID. So that's something to watch. Uh, moving on, another thing that I'm watching has to do with breach of contract issues. I think that we'll start seeing more and more of those. And that will be because there will be some contract interference due to COVID. There are a number of legal arguments that can be made when there is uh, an inability to perform a contract due to unforeseen for uh, circumstances or because the purpose has been frustrated or it's become impossible to in, to perform and so COVID may be uh, the basis for some of those arguments you've probably all heard of force majeure provision provisions in a contract those may come up though that's the argument that um, an unforeseen circumstance like an act of God or a natural disaster or or war prevents you from performing a contract and so we may see some try to use those force majeure clauses in, uh, in getting excused performance from a contract. So that's something we're watching. And then also, uh, I've really been interested to see when we'd uh, start hearing about lawsuits against employers for employees who've contracted COVID and, and may try to argue that it was due to the work environment or demands placed upon them by the employer or pressure to work in a, in a COVID type situation. And we have, we have seen some of those lawsuits. They've already begun. The big one that hit the news last week was a lawsuit against Walmart by uh, the estate of a gentleman who died from coronavirus. And they have sued Walmart for failing to protect adequately that employee and other employees. There actually was a second employee at the same store who passed away shortly after the first. And so the lawsuits have begun. And that will be interesting to see how those play out because they'll be very dependent upon uh, the state stay at home orders, as well as the actions that were taken by the employer and the actions taken by the employees. So they could be pretty messy. And so with that, I will turn it back over to you, David, and hope that everyone sleeps well on that handful of law that I just gave you. Well, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more. Um, rest assured, we thought the, the, this past week was going to be quieter, and it didn't. Things keep ramping up, um, and especially how we react to all the new legislation that's there. Um, we have a question in about Fortune 500 companies, but I think most of us panelists would say we probably need to fact check an answer on that one that we see up in the box right now. So we'll do that. And that's a great reminder as we, it's, it's amazing how quick an hour and a half. I've been trying to get the team to go for maybe five hours on a Monday night, um, maybe start at dinner time and just go for the entire evening. Seems like we have lots to talk about and never enough time to talk about. Um, but as we as we get ready to close our meeting, I uh, just want to remind you as you hit the end, as you leave the meeting, Ben has set up a nice exit survey that you can put your questions in. We would um, enjoy seeing some of the questions that you'll have um, as we go forward for next Monday. Or maybe you think of a question that uh, two days from now and you want to get it to our team, we would encourage you to send your questions our way. And again, uh, we have more information which we shared, but you can you can see any of us or email any of us or call us if you have some questions, um, but we would encourage you to take the time to just use a quick minute to ask some of those questions on your way out of tonight's program. Hey David, just, don't, don't forget to remind them that these are all gonna be uh, recorded and posted. Okay, and they all, and that's a great reminder, Barry, that they're posted, they'll be posted on the farmoffice.osu.edu website. Also, it's part of the Ag Madness, and we're just, um, if you've enjoyed this, and we've had a whole host of 
programs offered by OSU Extension uh, this month at the Ag Madness, go.osu.edu forward slash Ag Madness. You can check out those um, recordings. These are recorded. Uh, the session from last Monday, if you missed it, is recorded, and that's on the Farm Office Live. Um, you can see the Go link there on your screen. Uh, so with that, we're at the bewitching hour of 9.30 p.m., so we want to thank you. Had another great group of folks on tonight from across the state of Ohio. So I would like to thank our entire team, Ben, Barry, Diane, Peggy, Julie, um, for being here this evening to just give some insight on what's happening out there in the farm management world. And um, just as a reminder, this too shall pass. Uh, it's just given us more experience as we, um, as we go forward. So we um, thank everyone for joining us tonight. And just as you exit, just we just encourage you to do the exit survey. And with that, have a great evening.